Okay, it's seven o'clock. This is the Sherburn Zoning Board of Appeals. We're meeting on Zoom. I'm Rick Novak, the chair. My fellow board members are Jonathan Fitch and Ron Stefik. They're both here. This is the continued hearing for the Coolidge Crossing 40B local initiative project um, off Coolidge Street in Sherburn. Um, I believe if I recall from last time, uh, there was some discussion of the lighting plan um, and, most, and a lot of discussion of the CONSCOM. Um, let's start with the lighting plan on which I think we've now come to rest. Uh, Michael Lesser, I see you're here. It looks like a new plan was submitted and that you were satisfied with it or at least reasonably satisfied with it. Correct. Okay, great to hear. Thank all you right. for the changes. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you in the meeting for the changes. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, Okay, uh, I think last time we'd asked the Conservation Commission to get back to us with recommendations on what they would like us to do as we, as we stand in their shoes under their local regulations, not under the state regulations for wetlands purposes. They gave us a, a, a very detailed memo on August 2nd. Thank you, Conservation Commission. Who's ever here from the Conservation Commission? Maybe Michael, maybe it's you, maybe it's others. I can't see everybody. We have so many attendees, um, but, but we thank them for that. Um, <clears throat> that's very helpful. Um, the applicant, I, th I think there's one procedural aspect of that uh, memo that I want to speak about, which is at the end, it talks about the possibility of our board deferring some elements of the local regulations and sending them as a sort of a later condition back to the Conservation Commission. And it's, <clears throat> it's definitely my understanding through town council that we can't do that. Um, if anyone um, on the call or not on the call has a case or a statute or a regulation that says that's within our powers, we're, we're open to hearing it. But I think for now, the, uh, the thought is, uh, as, as suggested by counsel to the applicant who agrees with town council, that we really can't defer or put off our statutorily hijacked role of standing in the shoes of the Conservation Commission. So uh, I don't know if people have questions about that. Oh, I'll say, this is Michael. Uh, Michael Lesser, Conservation Commission hat this time. Um, that wasn't fully what that last paragraph was go getting at, was opposed to whether you, rather than doing some of the detailed work under with the peer reviewer now, whether you could write more general uh, conditions that might be strongly worded about the fact that they would accommodate wetland considerations that would come later. It was, it was sort of more oriented that way than to, than that you would assign that kind of bylaw stuff to later. Okay, um, th th that's a good clarification. It it's still my understanding that we can't do that. I, I see Dennis Murphy on the line. He's, he's one of the abutters. He's very expert in 40B. If he thinks, uh, uh, certainly conservation could speak with him, but if he thinks we can sort of defer our statutory role of acting on behalf of the CONSCOM, um, and he has a case or a regulation to back up that, uh, you know, we're, we're open-minded to seeing it, but for now we're gonna go with what town council says. Okay. Right. Again, that wasn't exactly what I meant. Um, it was the my understanding of what we were trying to get at there is that rather than you passing it off, the question is in the example of, let's say the landscape plan, how much detail gets done under your uh, it's part of the ZBA process versus a condition written that that is a little bit more general about how things happen, but uh, or what should be done. But that uh, I can go into that more later if you want, or whether right. uh, speaking a dead uh, horse. Um, Michael, you're not hearing hearing me, and or I'm not articulating it well. The point of the statute is to stop us from doing exactly that. Okay, I, I'll let it go. Let's go on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, however, um, standing in the shoes of the Conservation Commission, we definitely are interested in hearing um, the peer reviewers and the 
uh, public's uh, responses to the CONSCOM suggestions. They're on the table. They're definitely part of our process. I think the uh, from the development team standpoint, <clears throat> you had your engineer of record weigh in, uh, Matt, if I, I don't want to characterize your letter, but saying, well, we think we can do A, B, and C, but we can't do D, E, and F. Um, and I guess what I'd suggest might be a good next step, although I'll, I'll take comments from the general public, is that we, the board, ask our peer reviewer to look at the CONSCOM's memo carefully and the applicant's response carefully and, and wearing his good peer review hat, uh, tell us what he thinks uh, is feasible here and, 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 and consistent with good practice. Board members, I don't know how you feel about that. <clears throat> I, I, I basically agree with that approach. That's, we should we we should have our peer reviewer advise us. Right. Yes, um, I agree. I would like the advice of our peer reviewer. <clears throat> Steve Boulay, are are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, great. I just I couldn't find you in the in the sea of faces on a couple of different screens. Oh, there you are, right next to me. Um, <laughs> Is there a, uh, I, I know you haven't had a chance to really digest this yet, but having seen the CONSCOM's memo and the applicant's response, do you have a sense of what um, what sort of time frame you would need to give it a, a, a thoughtful view? I think this is something that we could do in, in say another two weeks. Uh, I, I don't think that would be a huge issue. Okay. Um, and from the applicant standpoint, could that work? I think that it could. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you want, while the peer reviewer is here, if you want Matt to um, walk through his responses at all, if it's any questions or... I mean, that, that'd be great, because some people may not have read the, the back and forth. And uh, if Matt, if you'd lead us on it, that, that's, that's a good idea, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so I guess just uh, as, as a, just to start off, um, I, we just, and we made this clear in the letter, but um, we want to express that the design that is before ZBA on the current site plans um, was, it came together uh, as a result of a collaboration between multiple different uh, professionals on the design team, um, including wetland scientists, landscape architects, uh, engineer, as well as the, the, um, the Baystone Sherborne team themselves. And um, it was not done um, without consideration of, of wetland areas, nearby wetland areas and, and buffer zones. So that was one of the fundamental aspects of the existing site that helped shape this development. And our, um, our takeaway from the CONCOM letter in, in general was that there was sort of this underlying tone or presumption that the design before you doesn't really factor that in. So let's now start looking at that. And um, we just want to express that's not the case. So while uh, Baystone could be open to suggestions, um, you know, as long as they're economically viable and, and not detrimental to the project, uh, this project did um, take these these uh, matters into account in, in this in the design that's before you. Um, so just for example, um, I, I, I listed out in the letter some aspects of the project uh, that, that did just that. Um, and so first from a sort of an overall fundamental standpoint, the project itself is a, is a clustered development. So there's uh, many units within a small footprint which in itself is sort of a non-sprawling type development, very compact in nature relative to the number of units, both from a building footprint standpoint, as well as um, a yard and a disturbance area. So uh, if you look at the, the amount of area that would be not by yard, say for single family homes of, of this number of single family homes, it would be much greater than, than this type of development. So it's a very compact uh, development. Um, also, I, I want to express, and I know we've talked about this, uh, particularly in the beginning when we first did the, uh, the overview of the project, there's no wetland alteration proposed uh, for this project. So 
all proposed disturbance is within upland areas. Uh, that being said, of course, some of those upland areas are within uh, 100 feet of wetlands, uh, which is why we're having this conversation tonight. But I just want to make clear, no wetland disturbance is proposed. It's all upland area that we're talking about. Um, we held in the design, we held all impervious area. So uh, building footprints, structures, uh, pavement, parking areas, garages, all of the impervious area is at least 50 feet from the edge of wetlands. The only elements that go within, within the first 50 feet of wetlands are grading, utilities, and stormwater. Uh, and so I just want to clarify, no structures are within that first 50 feet. Um, the front and rear yards, if you, uh, if you study the plan uh, and, and look at the grading, both in front and behind the building, they're, they're very small yards. Uh, so we, we did not provide expansive yards, we provided small yards in order to be able to have the grading catch, catch back up to existing grade to minimize the footprint of disturbance. The site is not overly parked. Um, so there's certainly sufficient parking for the residents and the guests. But if you look at the parking ratio, it's around 1.7 spaces per unit. That's, that's kind of on the low end of what would be typical for this type of development. So there's not a, a vast amount of um, uh, surplus parking spaces that are just eating up room and, and, and adding to the impervious area. So we tried to strike that balance of enough parking, but not overly parked. Um, the garage structure, so there's several garage structures that cover some of the surface parking and rooftops over the parking do keep some of the rainwater from contacting the pavement and picking up um, the pollutants that would otherwise be picked up if, had they not be, been covered uh, by the garages. Um, the, the runoff characteristics uh, of the, the, both the pre and the post development uh, site uh, are, are very similar, so uh, reasonably similar, I would say. So uh, no development can have exactly the same uh, hydrological uh, characteristics in the proposed, but the, the goal is always to um, replicate existing to the, to the maximum extent practicable. And that's what the stormwater regulations um, in, intend to accomplish. And so uh, if the stormwater report that we submitted, it, it um, it identified several study points uh, associated with, with each of the different wetland areas. And um, it, it took a very detailed look at the runoff from each part of the site. So we didn't just take the whole site and say, what's running off it now and what's running off it in the proposed. We broke it down into many, um, many different areas, runoff areas, study points. And we looked at that and we, we um, made every effort to uh, replicate the existing hydrology and um, that that report those calculations have been peer reviewed uh, and and you've received a, a, you know comments on that and, and we've addressed comments on that um, and then lastly the the stormwater treatment that's proposed for this site uh, is extremely uh, an extremely high level of treatment so um, we're proposing the stormwater uh, to be collected from the paved areas, routed through what we call deep sump hooded catch basins. So there's an initial uh, pretreatment through those. The water then goes through uh, water quality units, which each of those uh, by themselves meets the DEP um, total suspended solid removal requirement. Um, but we go through those and then we, the, the, the um, pretreated water is then uh, put into infiltration basins and infiltrated uh, into, into the underlying soil. So uh, in terms of uh, sediment removal, um, metals, uh, organics, that treat, we call the treatment train, sort of the series of, of treatment uh, practices that the water goes through, provides an extremely high level of treatment for this site. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that clear because there were some questions in the memo about uh, if, if, if um, additional stormwater treatment could be achieved. Uh, so I guess, would you like, Mr. Chair, would you like me to go through the individual comments now? I'm, I'm happy to run through them, but that was sort of the overview uh, of, of 
where, where, you know, how we think um, this project uh, already, uh, you know, meets and, and has been designed um, with, with the wetlands and the buffer zones uh, in mind. Right. One of the great things about Jeannie being so diligent about posting all this online is that everybody gets a chance to see everything before the hearing. I did want to take this chance to compliment everybody involved, whether on the neighbor's side or on the applicant side with doing a good job of getting us everything in writing well in advance of the hearings. I know the other board members of I have suffered through other hearings where everything comes in five minutes before the hearing starts in a file that nobody can read. And, uh, and, and then whoever submitted it assumes the rest of the world magically understands it all. And, and everyone's been very, very great about that. So we appreciate it. Um, so I don't think you need to read, read us your, your responses. Um, <clears throat> however, the CONSCOM is not the only party who's allowed to have uh, opinions or views on the wetlands. And if there are members either speaking for the CONSCOM or just in interested members of the public who wanna be heard on the subject now, you can certainly speak up now. You'll get another bite at the apple when Steve Bully comes back with his report, but it might be useful for him to hear your concerns now. So if there are people who are concerned with the uh, CONSCOM memo or the issues it's raised or other related is wetlands issues, um, you are invited to speak up now. I, I had a question. I had a question, uh, Rick. Um, did, am I correct uh, in recalling that last time we met, there was some discussion of having to raise the grades on the site? And if so, has there been a uh, revised grading plan issued? Uh, he's going to touch with her. Matt, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. So the discussion um, wasn't exactly that. <laughs> Let me clarify. Uh, so the discussion was that this site, in order to meet the stormwater standards, um, the design that's before you currently that was originally submitted um, picks the site up to provide a, enough of a zone to uh, infiltrate the water and keep our ledge and right. groundwater separation. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, there was no discussion um, to pick this, to, to raise the site more than, than the current design. Okay. So no, there's, there's no need and, and no um, revised grading has been submitted. All right, great, thank you. Um, other questions, uh, Michael, let's maybe give other people a chance first, but we can loop back to you. Don't see anyone else. Wanted to speak up. I, I had another question, Rick. Oh, excuse me. Esteemed <laughs> board member Stefik, you can have as many questions as you want. Okay. Um, the, uh, the rear portion of uh, building one and building two where the grading is raised uh, in the uh, 50 to 100 foot buffer. Um, is there any... Uh, thought about creating a fence at the 50 foot buffer line to discourage people from uh, a lot of activity in the uh, in the 50 foot you know non-disturbed portion mr leadner so um no a fence has not been considered in that area um, what the, the current design uh, intends to uh, have happen in that area is have uh, a small backyard to the units and that backyard does meander in and out of that 50 foot offset from the wetlands in some areas. Um, and the idea is that that rear yard would be maintained and mowed as a small rear yard but then everything beyond that would, would um, just be let go to, to, for a while. So uh, essentially there'd just be sort of a natural barrier to, to keep people out of that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a maintained area that would sort of invite people to, to go in there. Uh, there'll be a clear delineation uh, in the field, but that delineation won't necessarily be right along the 50 foot line. It will be uh, sort of an offset from the building to, to maintain a, a yard area. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bully, comment. Uh, yeah, in, in other towns, um, 
conservation commissions will typically require, say, a you know a stone bound or, or some other marker uh, at that 50 foot line or, or whatever the local bylaw says in each town. Um, usually, or sometimes we you can put those in to kind of demarcate that that 50 foot line, and it'll it'll tell landscapers to say, okay, I can only cut from from this line back towards the building rather than you know maintaining within that 50 foot buffer. So it kind of it kind of keeps the a separation without having an actual fence because because typically <clears throat> and I can't speak for the commission, but typically commissions don't like to see fencing, especially in the in those buffer zones, just to to ensure that you know animals can migrate through the site or or, or whatnot. So um, that's just a recommendation. You know, it, it, you can put markers at the 50 foot if uh, if the Conservation Commission would would like that. All right. That's Could I just have a story? Could I hang on for just a moment? That's certainly a, a worthwhile uh, item. Um, Gino Carlucci, I skipped past. Do we have money in the budget to pay TetraTech to do this work for us? Yes, we still have money in the budget. Great answer. Thank you. <laughs> I made um, one. Can I say one thing, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson, correct. Um, listen, um, the CONSCOM sent out bids to do, uh, you know, peer review on this. And uh, Tetra Tech's a fine company, but they're an engineering company. And they sent in the worst bid, the bid that, that nobody liked. And furthermore, when the bid came in, it was for the town of Norfolk, not for the town of Sherburne. I just don't see why we should be so jumping into bed with uh, Tetra Tech on this issue. Thank you. Well, far from jumping into bed with Tetra Tech, uh, the CONSCOM has been asked uh, during the hearing and, and again, specifically by me in writing to, if there were good grounds to challenge Tetra Tech's qualifications here that they should be submitted to us in writing. And, and I hear you saying that, that you didn't like their bid to the CONSCOM. And uh, if, if you wanna write that up and, and put it in the record, we'll, we'll take a look at it. But, but we will need uh, good substantial grounds to, to change horses. And if the answer is, you know, it was like Rick Novak offering to do it, and Rick Novak's no engineer, that's a question of competence. Um, but but we, we want something serious and, and on the record. It wasn't, I didn't raise this issue. The CONSCOM raised it at their meeting. Okay, yeah, I, 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 but, 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 they were very- I would just but, like to comment on that if possible. Yes, okay. Michael. All right, just one more comment on, on Tetra Tech and then everything else on Tetra Tech is gonna be in the record. Yes, Mr. Lesser. Just to answer Mr. Thompson's uh, or reply to that alone, I have other issues to say, but I'll, let, I'll just say to this one that uh, it, Tetra Tech's bid was certainly not bad. Uh, it, was comp it was similar, but not as strong as some of the others in terms of what they, uh, the others were stronger. Um, and I'll say, and that there's still to be had a formal notice of intent permitting process before the Conservation Commission to come. Um, and we would, that's when we would use the, the, the consultant that we did pick at the time. And that at this point, given that as in the letter, this is not a full review of the project from our point of view. This is just some limit, this is some set of some subset of the issues that we feel like maybe could be best addressed that can possibly be addressed within the context of the ZBA hearing with its with the limitations in terms of that it's a ZBA peer reviewer, it's not our consultant and things like that. And so therefore we selected a few topics to that is more bounded for this kind of process here with the ZBA and that a more a difference, a different level of scrutiny with the other consultant will be had when they come before us with their notice of intent. And I don't mean and I don't and I don't want people to get the any view that Tetra Tech did not give us a reasonable bid. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, Tetra Tech, do you have anything to say to that? Or, or very briefly, very, very briefly, because I would like yes, to- Yes, I, I appreciate Mr. Lester's uh, words there. Um, you know, I'd just like to add that we are an engineering company uh, and we do also have wetland scientists on, on staff. So we do all types of site design in, in wetland science. So we are fully qualified to, to represent the town uh, in this matter. Okay. And any challenge to that 
write it up, put it on the record with us. Um, uh, other comments that have nothing to do with Tetratex qualifications or lack thereof uh, bearing on uh, bearing on the wetlands issues. Uh, Mr. Liedner. Thank you. Very Back quick, Mr. Lesser. Very quickly, uh, in response to uh, Mr. Belay's uh, previous comment about the uh, potentially considering the no disturbed bounds, um, I would just clarify that if if the board uh, were thinking that condition would be beneficial, uh, the pr we would act ask that it be um, bounding uh, the limit of work as opposed to the 50 foot line, because there are areas where the limit of work extends closer than 50 feet to the wetlands, as has been discussed. And um, the, the limiting the 50 foot buffer in the proposed in some areas would render there no yard behind some of the buildings. So we'd ask that it be the limit of work as opposed to exactly on the 50 foot notice. Okay. Good, good clarification, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lesser, I think you've been waiting waiting for your turn. Sure, now I'm willing to wait longer if there's other people who want to comment, but um, I guess- well, Why don't you start and I'll look. Um, I'll make a few general ones. I, uh, as to the letter there and Mr. Leidner's portrayal of it, I'm sorry if he felt like we were implying that there was no sensitivity to the wetlands in their design. That was not our intent of the letter by any means. Um, a project of this scale um, has maximized use of the site to a great degree. And we wanted to make it very clear that, that in a, from a wetlands protection point of view, the uplands are beyond, are, are the areas that are beyond the 100 foot buffer zone that deals with the wetlands. This project use extensively uses the buffer zone of the wetland. So I would character so that therefore there are significant issues with regard to wetlands, even though I greatly appreciate the sensitivity that there's no wetland resource used, there is significant use of the buffer zone, including the 50 foot no alteration zone. So just to make that as a and uh, so that's why you have all those kind of cotton those that the points being made is because of its extensive use of the buffer zone, which in turn affects the wetland resource functions and what we're trying to protect. Um, the, uh, um, in terms of some of the issues that we put forward here that I think that it's gonna be a, we'd like to see what the peer reviewer comes up with and things like that, but there are significant issues on the, for example, in the stormwater, it's still that issue I'd like to just see. There's been a difference of opinion about between even when the peer reviewer acknowledged that maybe there's some other things that could be looked at, taking into account the fact that the significant parts of the, of the stormwater management system are in the buffer zone. And I appreciate that you say that everything is done to high quality and to high water quality levels. Yes, there are certain standards that you had to meet. I'm not sure whether there are ones where you can go a little bit further given the fact that you're in the no alteration zone and such like that. So it's not that you, the, the use of the word high quality is a little, it's fine. It's, it, it, you've met the standards and the question what more can be done possibly as to whether that's something that, that you can be uh, pushed to do or it makes sense to do. I'll wait to hear what the peer reviewer says about that kind of thing there. I mean, and, and I don't wanna get into little comments like, whether the, the, I mean, the covers for a garage make some sense. Sure, it doesn't hit the road, but the stuff is coming off the road anyway, uh, whether it's covered by a cover or whether there's water that goes underneath it eventually there, there's still, that stuff is really there, but that's something to see what the peer reviewer has to say, whether there's some ways to reduce the space there. And, and even as to parking, I appreciate that you might use less than the average. We're just trying to see again, given the amount of use in the buffer zone of the stormwater management system, whether it could be cut back if there were some changes there. I have, you've said before that tweakings of the system or somebody else did. I'd like to just see whether that's what it amounts to from the peer reviewer. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate the fact that, right, we haven't had a chance to review the stormwater stuff there. And it would be, and I'd like to feel like in some of the comments there about whether you've looked at, sense, at the, at the post-development hydrology and to what extent it's sensitive to the different parts of the wetlands because we've had other projects where they've met it in aggregate the post development, but then there were just different flows to different parts of the wet, different 
areas of wetlands. And if that, and if you've done that kind of work, we'll hopefully hear that from the peer reviewer. Um, and, I would, and that's that's that would be good to hear. Um, the uh, um, as to moving on to some of the other stuff there. Uh, Right. I mean, I'll be curious to see. We'll find out what the peer reviewer says about things like, uh, uh, I mean, we're we're charged um, that uh, we're charged with dealing with what with, with wildlife habitat impacts, um, and it doesn't. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to get into disingenuous comments. I mean, I just I almost don't want to take the bait or react to the idea that. You have two wetlands that were connected before, basically with un, undeveloped properties, and in some cases, un, untouched buffer zones um, there. And to say that now with, with all the buildings and roadways and everything else between them, that we feel that wildlife will be able to make their way between the two wetland systems, it's just a little disingenuous. I won't say anything more than that, other than I, we recognize that there will be some significant adverse impact to that particular uh, interest of the wetlands that we're supposed to uh, address, but uh, not everything is perfect, but we don't have to go too far in terms of saying that there's no problems with it. Um, and we'll see what the other peer review says, and it'll also come up in the NOI review process. Um, the landscape process, going on to that one, um, again, is right. It's going to be a tricky balance between the fact of what kind of yard you want to have around these places? We've run into this before with projects like this that build right up to the uh, to the edges of buffer zone, fifty foot buffer zone, and others. Um, and right, it's a tough one about the fact that all of that, to the extent that we're trying to that wetlands function well when the buffer zones function well and are preserved. You avoid that in our local bylaw, we have the presumption that significant changes in the no alteration zone will cause adverse effect in the buffer zone. Um, and there's a lot of work being done from the grading to and, and whatnot um, and, uh, and taken up in, the, in that no alteration zone as well as the buffer zone as a whole. Somehow doing more with what it is, we'll see what the peer reviewer comes up with, with the fact that whether that kind of buffer zone to what extent it could be maximized, the amount of the kind of landscaping plan that's put in place and, and maximizing the amount of that with some markers. Um, certain kinds of fences are acceptable to us in the sense that they don't impede wildlife as opposed to a chain link fence, as opposed to a spurt rail fence and things like that. Monuments are always nice to, to be more permanent. Um, but right, the question is, is whether it can be uh, it wasn't clear to me from the previous landscape plan that some of the stuff that you've mentioned here would be provided, but it would be a matter of uh, a more detailed plan here. If it's not done here, it would have to be done in the uh, NOI process as well or reviewed there about that it could be in terms of density of plantings and what kind of different herbaceous and shrub and other kind of layers are really maximize the buffer zone value and protecting the wetlands there in terms of whether it's wildlife or just even water infiltration, water filtration. Um, but there's usually a lot more detail given in a, uh, in a true landscape plan under uh, the wetlands permitting process. We'll see how far we can go and, and how far where the limits are because you do have a lot of, that's part of the issue. Uh, yeah, when I look behind some of these buildings, what it is behind building two that could be done to minimize that uh, the distance there and how much could be landscape and then fenced off and protected. But I think we'll be coming back to a lot of this after we hear the peer review and then we'll also have another issue there. But, uh, um, and I do appreciate, again, I'll, I'll end up on a more positive note. Yes, I appreciate there are no buildings in the no alteration zone and the wetland resources have not been built on but there's still significant uh, building there. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Boulay, I'm, I'm sure you've been taking that all in, and uh, we'll uh, we'll consider it in your in your uh, remarks to us, uh, Mr. Boulay. In the in the first instance, and then the board in the second instance, have the unhappy task of balancing um, uh, the desirability of various uh, changes to the plans that might work better for wildlife, or drainage, or or protection of uh, of, of no build zones, 
against um, the need for affordable housing uh, in the region um, and then the li likely outcome, uh, like re likely reaction of HAC to any uh, any conditions uh, or, or turn down that we, we base on things like wildlife or, or, or stormwater. Um, so, Mr. Boulay, we'll look, we'll look to you to guide us. Noted. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, can I comment on some of Michael's comments? Uh, briefly, yes, please, sir. Okay. Uh, the planting that we are proposing in that letter is not currently on the plan. So we will have that planting in the wetland buffer areas added to the plan, including in the detention basins for our next meeting. And one other item that uh, was mentioned many times by the CONCOM concerned about some of the impervious area and that we consider reducing the depth of the parking spaces to 18 feet. We are willing to do that if we get consensus from this board and we'd be happy to have that ready for the next meeting if you so prefer. I think it would be helpful to have that at the table speaking solely for myself. It, you know, the more of these issues that we can move to this, move into the, uh, the agreed category, the better. Okay, we'll take care of that. Um, other members, uh, other comments from other members of the, I see a hand up, uh, Mr. Bresnahan. Yeah, um, my name is Scott Bresnahan, I live at 126 Coolidge. And um, with relate, in relation to the amount of activity in the, uh, the buffer zone, has there been any thought given to the potential impacts on the uh, local water table, which is already quite high, and especially the Meadowbrook and Natick side of Coolidge neighborhood? Mr. Leadner, delay. Sure. I can address that, uh, if I may. Uh, yes, the the stormwater uh, management system design has taken the water table uh, into account. We actually went out there and did extensive um, test uh, test pit exploration throughout the site, documented the water table, and have maintained the um, the required uh, separation to the water table and. Um, we've spread the stormwater management systems out throughout the site in a way as not to focus uh, everything into one area. Um, so the, the water table uh, situation, we, we realize there's a relatively shallow water table out there and we have taken that into account. And does that also account for the potential impacts with the, the buildings within the buffer zone, which you're probably going to offset some of the current water there that has to then and be distributed somewhere else, not just a stormwater remediation. Mr. Chair. Please. It does account for them. Uh, so these, I'm not sure if you meant the foundations would be displacing water, um, but these buildings do not have basements. Uh, so the, uh, the slabs that they'll be built on will be up above the water table. Um, and I'm not sure if you've attended previous meetings, but the site itself, the grades are going to be picked up from existing. Uh, so, so as not to be building within the, the existing water table. Okay. Mr. Lesser, I think, had his hand up. Yeah. By, by the way, for those of you who can raise your hand in, in the Zoom function, that's, that's great. If you can't, uh, wave at the camera and, and Jeannie and I will try to see it. Well, sorry, sorry, I'm doing it that way. Uh, All good. I'll try to add a little bit more to the last, to Mr. Bresnahan. Um, that if I think I hear your concern about the about the amount of water being whether there's water being shifted from the site there onto neighbors, so to speak, yes. um, that the stormwater standards that they have to meet for the project, when we talk about this pre and post hydrology, um, is essentially they're supposed to uh, do the stormwater and infiltration on site such that the water leaving the site is similar to the water that was leaving the site before the project was in place so that it shouldn't change what so if you have problems before you'll have problems after uh, or you don't have problems you shouldn't have problems uh, that it's that the, the, the regulations are written to just sort of to sort of reach for the status quo um, there if that is a little maybe another way to answer yep. your question um, some, someone, someone said they had a question. Okay. All right. Um, well, board members, unless you have further commentary on this, I think we're in a position to move on and, and try to pick a meeting date somewhere in the two week time frame to give Mr. Boulay a chance to do his job. 
and then we could all wind up by throwing arms and throw rocks at him. Metaphorically, not 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 literally. <laughs> if I um, could add, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I could say something, please. Um, I'm actually going to be going on a paternity leave soon, um, so we're hoping to get the letter you. in in two weeks. But I do have Sarah White with me uh, this evening. She will be taking over uh, my role uh, while I'm out on paternity leave. Um, but until then, we you know we will be. Um, you know, we will be reviewing it with our wetland scientists and uh, and hopefully getting a you know a letter over to you shortly. We'll look forward to hearing from Ms. White and we appreciate that your other role is far more important than anything you could do for us. <laughs> Good luck with that, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, all right, so two weeks is the week of March 20, uh, March, uh, uh, week of April 26th, it's after school vacation for those for whom that is relevant. Um, could we do something in the middle of that week, board members? Fine with me. Yeah, it's fine with me, April 28th, uh, Wednesday the 28th, of the, or Thursday the 29th, it's fine. <clears throat> All right, Wednesday the 28th, um, any, um, uh, Sarah White looks like you're gonna be up to have something for us before then, but it looks like you're confident you can do so. I see you're nodding yes, so we'll take that as a yes. Okay, great. Um, applicant, April uh, continuance to April 28th, work for you. Yes, that's fine. All right. Um, in that case, I'm going to move that we uh, continue the hearing. Hold on, Michael, before, just before we vote that. That we continue the hearing to April 28th. Uh, 2021. Can I have a second for that? And then during discussion, we'll take Michael. Second. All right. So moved and seconded to continue to April 28th, but this hearing is still open. Mr. Lesser. I was wondering if we could change gears, uh, whether beyond the wetlands, um, and I could speak Michael Lesser as, as the energy committee, um, and uh, whether I could bring up the uh, an issue that whether I could I could write something in and whether for the uh, base stone to consider and you to consider whether there's a possibility of, I'm always angling for a little bit more energy efficiency and a little more sustainability here. And I keep trying to find little angles here. And I know that that base stone has been willing to try to do something and they're waiting to see how the costs of the project all emerge as to how far they can go on doing some more innovative kind of things. Uh, I want to know whether to bring up the idea whether I could whether you would entertain uh, and for the developer to think about whether conditionings of things like that all appliances should be either energy star or water sense, which is a rating for being more efficient water usage, um, whether that's the kind of thing that uh, I would like to maybe uh, suggest and maybe well, it'll just be at the next meeting um, and how you how to do that kind of thing. Certainly a writing in advance of the next meeting would be terrific um, because then that will give the board the benefit of uh, the developer's response. Certainly, I hope you heard me last time that to the extent that uh, these energy efficiency uh, items are going to significantly affect economics, our uh, ability to condition the project uh, on this, given that it's a affordable housing project is uh, <laughs> beyond extremely limited. I think Jonathan will correct me that it's non-existent. Um, so we need to yes, be careful. I've heard, heard, heard that. I'm hoping that there might be some receptivity uh, even from the developer side since these things are are uh, possibly very low cost. You can go buy a water sense toilet for hundred dollars too, uh, but whatever. I will try right. and leave right. it next time. All right. Um, <clears throat> unless there's further discussion. Oh, Mr. Pitch, do you have something to say? No, I mean, uh, Michael has the power of persuasion. He can write a letter uh, to uh, the developer, but uh, as um, you've said, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's very unlikely that we would uh, condition our uh, order on uh, energy efficiency requirements. Right, the, the leading case, uh, I see Mr. Murphy there, we'll give him another shout out. His, that's your case, the Stowe case, right? 
um, said the towns can can turn these things down on uh, I'll have the I have the wrong term, but essentially extremely serious uh, public health reasons. I think in the Stowe case, it was contamination of groundwater from the septic system. Uh, I think uh, running wells dry probably gets into that same category, but it, it can't just be um, things that hack will view as wish list items. Mr. Murphy, you can probably correct me where I got that wrong. No, Mr. Chairman, that's exactly right. I think the board's prerogative is, as always, act in the best interest of the town to protect what are defined by the statute as uh, local concerns. And, uh, you know, in, in the order of priority, uh, someone's drinking water is a very high priority and other things might be lesser priority, such as perhaps low flow fixtures. Uh, but again, I think everyone has the idea that this is a balance and that's, that's kind of the touchstone. Got it, thank you, sir. Okay, um, moved and seconded to continue the hearing to April 28th. Absent uh, a lot of people waving their hands and saying we shouldn't do that. That's my next move. So I don't see much of anybody. Okay. Um, Board members all in favor of continuing to the 28th, say aye. Aye. I guess we have to do it by roll call. Novak, aye. Stefik, aye. Pitch, aye. Well, that means the nays are a null set. All right, so we're continued to the 28th. Thank you all for your, uh, for your attention to this important matter. We appreciate Thank it. You. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank I, want you. Every, I want everybody to be vaccinated by the time we next come together. So get to work on that. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.